Hello, welcome to our 9 o'clock online worship at First Christian Church in Keokuk. If you're joining us for the first time, I'm Pastor David Turner, and I'm, I'm glad that you're, uh, that you're watching with us from, from home. I'm going to be joined today by our worship pastor, Brian Nixon, our youth minister, uh, Janelle Quinlan is going to be here. She's going to offer the prayer in just a moment. Uh, Joyce Hagee is on uh, organ, and uh, we've got a couple of folks in, uh, in the tech booth uh, today. Scott Gibson and Noel Brown are our tech wizards uh, working behind the scenes to, to bring this to you. Just this past week, uh, announcements were, were made about some of the restrictions being lifted on churches and, and on in-person worship services. And so a lot of people have had questions about when we would be able to be back together again in worship. Uh, our goal here at First Christian Church is to be and to share the good news. That's, that's our mission statement. Uh, what we're trying not to do is to share the COVID-19 coronavirus. And it turns out uh, what we're learning is that in-person services are, are one of the, the worst places in terms of spreading uh, the, uh, the, the, the virus uh, because of talking and singing, droplets get in the air, and you're spending time in, uh, in, a, in, a, in one place with a lot of people. And uh, so we're, we're continuing to operate right now with the utmost caution, and uh, we're also going to be meeting this coming week to begin plans on what that might look like when we do start bringing people back to church. I know one of our primary goals is going to be to help get those folks who don't have internet, that don't have any way to get online, to get them reconnected. We've already begun, begun to put a, a list together. Uh, Kathy Courtois, our connections pastor, has been working on that. If you know somebody who is completely disconnected, uh, unable to access us online, please drop us an email or give us a call or stop by the church office during the week and, uh, and let us know so that we can add them uh, to that list. A couple of quick things as we get started. On Wednesday nights, I offer a Bible study at 6.30. Uh, this is kind of in place of our, our normal Wednesday night activities. I'm, I'm thinking this is something that we'll run through the summer which we normally wouldn't do on Wednesday nights. Uh, but we take a kind of a deep dive into the text that I'll be preaching on uh, that, that coming Sunday. And so I invite you to tune in on our Facebook page uh, for a, a Facebook Live premiere at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. Uh, we invite you to support our KOKX radio ministry. This is one way that we're connecting with people who, who can't get online. And uh, so it's all the more important that we get sponsors uh, for, for some of the upcoming Sundays. As you can see, we've got some dates available right now. Uh, so if, you, if you'd like to uh, support that ministry and sponsor a Sunday in honor or in memory of, of, of someone or something, uh, please, uh, uh, again, send us an email or, or give us a call and uh, we'll, get that, we'll get that set up. And uh, at this time, we're going to begin our worship and song. Again, if you were here, I would have you stand, but you're welcome to remain seated at home as we sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Thank you. 
have any prayer requests this morning or updates, you can list them in the comments below and we can pray together this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, all glory and honor belong to you today. We give you thanks for the mighty way you are working in people's lives. Thank you for another day to serve you with the purpose that is greater than our eyes can see. You provide the guidance for every decision that is made, for every challenge that we need to face, and every celebration that will bring people joy today. Guide us with your peace and understanding and fill us with your wisdom to keep our minds focused on you, to discover our journeys that you will provide for us this, during these current trials that we're facing. Your timing is never late. Your plan for us is always better than what we can come up with. And you know what tomorrow brings for us. So we ask with bold faith and strength for what we need to face, what we need to change, and what we need to start doing to match the will that you have for our lives as you wrap us in the love and the grace right when we need it most. Thank you for opening our hearts wide to receive the love that you have for us, God, so that we can feel the outpouring of your spirit that fills our body and mind with your love, forgiveness, and your complete and total healing. Lord, we ask you to place a hedge of divine protection around families who couldn't join us this morning, the families who are at home worshiping with you today, and the people that just need you most. Hold them close this morning. We are so grateful that even though we can't be together, we are still coming together as one voice, praying the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Thank you so much to Debbie Spears and, and Kathy Gage who recorded that for us and, and Noel Brown who put all those pictures to it. Uh, what, a, what a beautiful job and, and, and it, was, it was wonderful to be able to see, uh, see those pictures from not that long ago. What a, a different world we live in now. Thank you also for, uh, again, for being here with us on this Memorial Weekend. Uh, Memorial Day started right after uh, the Civil War as a way of, of remembering those who gave up their lives so that our nation could remain one nation under God. And, uh, and it's continued to be a day that we celebrate those who gave the ultimate gift 
uh, of giving their lives in service to our country and in protection of our freedoms. And so we thank you, a uh, big thank you to, of course, to all those who, uh, who have served, uh, but especially those who gave up their lives. I'm going to begin my sermon today with one of the biggest insights into the Bible that I've ever had. In fact, when I finally understood this basic truth about the Bible, it changed everything for me. Unfortunately, it, uh, it, it really didn't sink in until several years after uh, I was ordained and already preaching. Like most people, I studied the Bible a story at a time. I heard ministers preach about Jesus and the things that he said and did. I had Sunday school teachers that taught me about Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark. One of my favorite Sunday school teachers actually had us build the Tower of Babel out of marshmallows and Elmer's glue. I've never forgot that story as a result of that. So I'm familiar with the stories. And I even had an idea of what those stories meant. But nobody really ever took the time to show me how all of those separate individual stories were part of a much bigger story. That's the insight. I know it sounds simple, but it really isn't. The Bible is one story of God seeking to be reconciled with His children. The Bible is one story, Old Testament and New Testament, not two separate stories, one story of God's self-revelation to creation, with Jesus Christ being the fullest expression of that revelation. So if there's any advice I would give to somebody who is seeking to understand the Bible, it would be to start with the big picture and then work backwards from there. Every individual story, every individual teaching is like a puzzle piece that fits into that bigger picture. If any of those individual pieces seem to contradict that bigger story, then you're probably missing something. The story I want to focus on uh, today is an important piece of the puzzle with which many of us may be only somewhat familiar. I'm guessing if I were to ask a, a group of disciples to list the, the uh, most important moments in the life and ministry of Jesus, the story I'm going to share with you in a moment might not even make the list. That's how much attention that we, we typically give it. Now, I'm sure I'd get most of the highlights of Jesus' life, his birth, you know, that trip that he took with his parents to Jerusalem when he was 12. Remember that? I, people think of that one. His baptism, the call of the first disciples. I'm sure people would think of uh, the Sermon on the Mount and, uh, and some of Jesus' miracles, like the feeding of the 5,000. But there's one more story that's critical for understanding the big story and how we fit into that story. And that's the story of Jesus' ascension. Now, I'm guessing most of you probably didn't get there before I did. The story of, of Jesus' ascension is described uh, by Luke in the very last chapter, the very last thing he describes in that, and it's described at the very beginning of the book of Acts, also written by Luke. Today we're going to read the story of Jesus' ascension as it's told in Acts 1, uh, which is set 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. So in the same way Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the law for 40 days, which was in preparation for making the people of Israel the people of the law, right? Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection, preparing them to become people of the Spirit. Uh, and, uh, and of course, what they did during that time, during those 40 days, they sheltered in place, basically. They weren't quarantining themselves from a virus like we have been, but rather they were afraid of being arrested and crucified like Jesus was. And, uh, and so we're going to read their story, uh, beginning at Acts 1, verse 1. We read there, In the first book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, I, just want, I want to pause here for a minute and just point out that throughout Jesus' ministry, his disciples were just sure that he was the, the king of Israel that was going to bring Israel back to its former glory, that they were going to be a military power, that they were going to rule the world. And, uh, and right up until the end, uh, you'd think that maybe they would have changed their tune, but even now, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, they're still just sure that this is the moment when Jesus is going to you know, throw off the, the, the uh, Roman occupation and, and take over the world. But again, Jesus was, his kingdom was not of this world. So he replies to them in verse 7, he says, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Now, I have to confess that my first encounter with this story of Jesus' ascension didn't come until I was in seminary. I'm not sure I'd ever even heard a, a, a sermon preached on it. And if I did, I, I wasn't paying attention. So, um, I was taking a, a worship course in, in seminary, and one of the assignments was to design six worship services, complete worship services, based on the church calendar with the assigned readings for each week. And it just so happened that Ascension Sunday fell right in the middle of that. And of course, Ascension Sunday is always one week before Pentecost. And so uh, I did the assignment like a good student. I, I wrote out all my prayers. I picked the appropriate hymns and, and all of that. But I'm thinking I must have been working on the assignment late at night because at some point, I guess I decided it needed a little bit of humor. And so after reading the scripture about Jesus' ascension, I titled my proposed sermon, I titled it, Up, Up, and Away. Seemed appropriate to me. My, press, my professor probably would have let that one pass and not written something snarky on my paper if I hadn't titled my Pentecost sermon, What Goes Up Must Come Down. And so at the time I wrote that, I, I have to say, I really didn't understand the importance yet of the ascension or, or how that story fits into the bigger story. But then I read a book by an author named N.T. Wright called Simply Jesus that helped me really understand how the ascension fits into the bigger story I've been talking about. As he explained, in order for Jesus to become available to everyone, to all people everywhere, he had to step out of this world and plug into heaven. Jesus explains this to his disciples in John 16, 7, when he says, But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. The ascension then was the day when Jesus was enthroned in heaven. Uh, or as, as I've, I've seen people posting this week, it's the day Jesus began to work from home. I think probably some of us can relate to that. It was the day he fully assumed the role of our eternal king, and by doing so, he was able to bless us in a new way. Now, there isn't a lot of fanfare about the actual ascension, which may be one of the reasons we don't think too much about it. Jesus simply spoke to the disciples, and then he was lifted up out of sight. And, of course, the disciples reacted about the way you'd expect. They stood there with their mouths hanging open, staring up into the clouds. 
But they weren't allowed to do that for very long because two angels appeared on the scene and basically said, don't you have something better to do? So we, re we read that the disciples returned to Jerusalem and for once they did what Jesus asked them to do. They, they waited and they prayed. It says, they returned to Jerusalem. All of the disciples with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They waited. Like the disciples waiting in Jerusalem for those final 10 days before the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, we've also been in kind of a, a waiting mode for a while. As strange as it feels uh, for, for somebody like me who associates serving God with activity, uh, sometimes the most faithful thing we can do is to wait. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is to wait. Or as somebody once said, don't just do something, sit there. Now, of course, this shouldn't come as a surprise. If God was only about activity, if God was only about productivity, He would have never taken a day off. He would have never called His people to do the same. So the disciples waited, just as Jesus asked them to. They prayed. They stayed connected to each other. And they sheltered in place. So, why is this story important to us? Why should the story of Jesus' ascension take such a, a, a major place in that bigger story, God's story? Because without it, we wouldn't have a place in the story. Our ancestors were Gentiles. They weren't a part of, of God's covenant with Israel. We weren't, at, at, at before the ascension, and before Pentecost, we weren't a part of the story. We were outsiders looking in. That's why Paul writes in Ephesians, of course this is post-Pentecost, but he writes in Ephesians 2, verse 19 and 20, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. He's talking to us. But you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. As 21st century Christians, we've been on the inside now for so long that we sometimes forget we haven't always been a part of God's story of salvation. About half the New Testament documents the early church's struggle with whether or not to open the church to people like us. I know that that's hard to believe. People who didn't grow up with the law. And it wasn't easy. That decision uh, was a difficult one for them to make uh, uh, for, for a, lot of, a lot of reasons. Uh, a lot of good people at that time were saying that new believers should have to follow Jewish law just like Jesus and the disciples had done. But as difficult as that decision must have been, can you imagine what that would, what that would be like today, having that, that same discussion? But as difficult as that decision might have been, Jesus set in motion our inclusion among God's people the moment he ascended into heaven. That was always his goal. That's what sealed the deal. That's what turned us from strangers into beloved children and citizens of God's kingdom. And as we'll see next week, we are called through the Holy Spirit to take that message of love and inclusion to the ends of the earth. But for now, we wait. For now, we shelter in place. For now, we wait for the Holy Spirit, which will come on Pentecost, to, uh, to fill us and to send us out into the world. And, uh, and once again, we will tell that story, which is a part of the bigger story, which is the greatest story ever told. We know that Jesus could not remain forever in his, in his physical presence with us here on earth. And though it may have felt to those earliest disciples that they were being, they were being abandoned 
um, in, their, in their time of need. We can, we can feel like that, not able to see and, and, and touch the physical body of, of Jesus for ourselves. But, but Jesus left us with the gift of his presence, even so. Left us with a way to touch and know the real presence of Jesus with us here and now, wherever, wherever we are. It is, it is in this bread and in this cup that we are able to be taken up and into the, into the real presence of Christ with us here. Now, I, I may be in trouble for, for saying anything, uh, but we could not find our normal communion bread this morning. I don't know if you can see, but this is, uh, this is a hot dog bun. And it is bread even so in that which we celebrate with this morning. And so you can be comforted knowing in your homes, whatever you have, bread, a cracker, a hot dog bun, that when you take it, when you break it, when you and your family celebrate communion together, the presence of Christ is, is with us, with you. And so we remember, as we partake, we remember that on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, he gave thanks, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Remember that after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. As often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. All are invited, welcome now to share in this time of communion together. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us at our 9 o'clock online worship service. Uh, please feel free to share the link to this service on your own uh, Facebook page. That's a, a, an easy way to be and to share the good news with people that might not otherwise uh, hear it. And so may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance and bring you peace now and forever. Amen. Thank you.